Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and m and Bank, Geneva Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Capital One Bank, the Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, Greenberg Trorug, Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from Aerial Property Advisors, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CVRE, Colliers International NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, CUNY TV Foundation, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Insurance Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Herrick Feinstein, Versha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman, USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. Many people have said that 2013, 2014 is probably the best time for real estate for the highest prices over the, over the years. So today, as opposed to bringing four people on the show, I'm bringing people who have been with me over the past 13 seasons to provide their real insight on what the market is, what's happening more on the commercial, the capital markets, the residential market, because these are the gurus who truly understand. My guests, they include Jim Kuhn, who is the president of Newmark Rub Knight Frank. And my other guest is my dear friend, Ofer Yardeni, who is the co-chairman and CEO of Stonehenge Partners. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. So, Jimmy, since you and I are similar in age, Ofer's a kid, you know, just <laughs> a couple years younger, in your career, which spans more than 40 years in real estate, how do you look at the world today? You had to say that, huh? I'm sorry. So you can't paint everything with the same brush. Here's one of the issues that I see today when people say, how's the market? It's the best ever. And I think it, it really depends on where in the marketplace you are. Now, everything's better than it's been since 2008. Um, when you say, what's the best market? The best market was in 1978. When we can buy office buildings for $50 a foot. But the best and highest values today um, obviously, the condo market, which uh, Ofer probably can speak to better than I can. But he's only done one condo building. No, oh, but you know what? You don't have to build a condo to understand a condo. Um, the rental market's as high as it's ever been in residential. And the office market um, in places is higher than it's been, and in some places it's not. And, and, but what about, you know, you know there, there's a sales market, okay? Let's talk about the, there's X amount of land in New York City that you can buy. The prices of land, I don't believe, and I still remember you were on my show many times, both of you, and we were talking about the price of oil. And you said when, when oil will reach $100, I'll, you know, it was something like that. Yes. I don't believe that if, if we would have sat three years ago, a year ago, two years ago, we wouldn't believe land to be selling developable land at $100. But for, for multifamily, foot. Michael, for, for office buildings, it's different. There have been, in 2013, there were 48 deals uh, over 100 and 21 deals over 125. That's more than it's been in five or six years, but it's not yet more than it was in 2007 and 2008. Prices for office buildings have gotten very high. And Time Warner's $1,100 a foot. 
But don't what tell me. What about 450 Park Avenue? 450 Park Avenue, $1,700 a foot. But that was similar price than it was the first time, the last time we sold to Somerset. The really crazy prices are where somebody decides that you can turn an office building into a condo. The Sony building, 650 Madison. You can't count those prices when you average what office buildings are being sold for. Um, you wonder well, who's going to fill all the shadow space on 6th Avenue. People talk about the astronomical rents that they're getting in secondary type buildings in, in locations that five years ago you wouldn't have thought about in Chelsea, right? Um, by the technology when and the media industry. When you and your partners bought the Flatiron Building, who ever thought that Midtown South, okay? Ophel wouldn't have even known what Midtown South was, okay? He had a certain thing. He, he always stayed on 48th Street. But I, I mean, Ophel, you've been in business close to 20 years. Uh, you haven't seen rents this high, the residential rents. You know, fortunately, you decided to sell your only office building because the office wasn't the market for you in the office market. How do you see the world today? Clearly, when I started the business, uh, the rental market, when we spoke about high rents in New York City, we spoke about Upper West Side, Upper East Side. And today, if you look at the market in the last, how it uh, changed in the last 25 years, you are speaking about areas from uh, Lower East Side to Greenwich Village to See, but Ibeka it was hip. To Jimmy grew up in Stytown. I mean, this is hip. They call that Gramercy Park, Gramercy they, North. They extended the Gramercy Park. But if you are going to look at the market, uh, uh, I've never seen rents uh, as high as they are today. Uh, we used to look at rents when we bought the Ritz Plaza in 1996 at $23 a square foot versus today we are getting $70 a square foot. We see, so we purchased building in Chelsea on 15th Street where we used to get $30 a square foot. Today our new buildings are $85 to $90 a square foot. I don't think that this is one specific area where the rents increase. I think the entire city but grew in terms of let me make Let me make one point which I think is important and I don't know that people think about it. The difference in, to me in the growth in rents in the office versus residential markets is in the multifamily market, it's been a clear increase in rents. I believe in, in the office market, it's more about cap rate compression. And the cap rates on office buildings have gone down to 4.2%. It's not that the rents have gone to the same multiples as condo prices. It's that the cost of capital keeps coming down and if you look, the other difference is the difference in the buyers are generational and they're different types of buyers in office where the multifamily developers riding the pricing up, they're, they're, they're consistently the same. So what I mean is you look at when, when Mark Holliday said some years ago when he paid $400 a foot for a building and I said, why are you paying so much? And he said, I'd rather overpay at 400 or 800. And then the next generation you know, was with the REITs and then Scott Reckler, and then now, I think the new dictum in New York is the foreign investors. When you look at Time Warner, and you look at uh, Adia and government of Singapore, um, Adia is interesting because they can buy, Time Warner is neither a core nor an opportunistic buy, right? Because it's a core for a while, and it's an opportunistic later. So the foreign investors, Fosun coming in to buy, pay the highest price, one Chase Manhattan Plaza. Um, Oxford buying uh, 450 Park Avenue. So what's ha what happened in the office market over these years is the cost of capital continues to come down and new capital comes in. In, in the condo market, the prices just continue to go up for the same but different reason, because the foreign investors are coming here to buy apartments because it's the but same. Jimmy, yeah, but the same thing with respect to the multifamily on the investment side. 20 years ago, you didn't have UDR, Equity Residential, Avalon Bay, or Charles C. Smith. Everybody remember that read that they just entered to the market in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Before that, they did not exist. But the ground so, of developers. No, but we're not talking okay. about developers. We're talking about income producing versus income producing. Now, when I started to buy my first building in New York, I thought I bought at 6% cap rate. But when really after 30 days, when I analyzed the building, when I owned the building, I realized it was really a 5% cap rate. Today, so that was in 1994, 1995. 
Today, an interest rate, we used to borrow at 8%. Today, we are buying multifamily uh, at 3, 2, or even below cap rate, but we borrow at 3%. But I really don't like to look at real estate as a cap rate because the fundamental thing for me is how much am I paying price per square foot? Because the way to each person runs the building in a different way, each one looks at the expenses in a different way, and usually when I get a pro forma, either from the broker community or from the seller, I cannot just take it as the Ten Commandment and leave these are the two expenses. So I think that cap rates but, are a but lot our lower. Market, but price per square foot. But our market this is besides the Manhattan has gone up. I mean, so the Brooklyn pricing, Williams the market. Queens pricing. Well, Alfred said he would never buy a Brooklyn. I, I didn't say that I would never <laughs> buy in Brooklyn. Remember, you said that. You, know, you have to understand. We have office, 400 million square feet in Manhattan. We have 800 or 600,000 residential apartments in the city. So if I can buy in New York City and I can walk to see my property. If you can buy in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Okay. If I can buy in Manhattan and I can walk, and remember that I also manage the, the real estate that we, we own. Both Jimmy and you have alluded, who have done well going to Brooklyn. And Extremely to Queens. well. I mean, because the market, you know, anything that has, uh, you know, we call it the TOD, the transit development, anything that's near the subway is highly desirable. Mm -hmm. And if it's convenient into the city, look, even Long Island City, 15 years ago, Jimmy, nobody was building. No. There was no TF corners. But, you know, we, we have two, when you cut through the profile of buyers, they're one of two types. They're value creators, value buyers, or they're momentum buyers. And, and what I mean is, in this kind of market, uh, somebody pays 400, next guy pays 500, next guy pays 600, and you, and you hope the market rot goes up and, you, and you're hoping for inflation and pricing, and that's one type of buyer. And the other type of buyer is somebody who sees value and creates value where somebody didn't see it. So four years ago, five years ago, if you looked in Williamsburg and you were Jeff Levine and you saw, even though he might have been a little early on his first project, he's going to make it back in spades, right? And, and, and if you see a building in New York where you can turn the first four floors into retail and the retail rents disproportionately change the price before you can pay for a building. But if you remember when you started in the real estate business, there were office buildings on Fifth Avenue that had large office entrances. Today, you don't see office buildings on Fifth Avenue with large office entrances. When 20, 30 years ago, you wouldn't see second floor retail or third floor retail. The world has changed completely in that aspect of retail. The retail world is different. There are different clients. I mean, 25 years ago, the gap was the number one. Today, the gap is closing their stores. You know, we have a different generation of, of real estate. I did a show recently on emerging trends in real estate. I had your colleague, Jeff Roseman, and we had City, City Med Urgent Care Center. We had Chopped. We had Equinox and Blink. These were companies who have been, weren't here 20 years ago. So we're seeing a proliferation and a different change in the real estate world. Life is changing every day. Right. You, you, were, say, you were saying before the show that what you, even the amenity packages of yep. what people want. And, you know, there was an article recently in the newspaper talking that in office buildings, they're trying to provide more amenity packages. I mean, th there's a different world. It's clearly that the type of tenants that we have in our multifamily, it's younger, more sophisticated, and they So all where are you considering us too old? <laughs> dinosaurs? We are not dinosaurs, but our expectation of what their expectation is completely different. If my kids are coming to a building, they expect to have a gym, they expect to have a roof deck, they expect to have a bicycle storage, they expect to have music, they expect to have a doorman. This is what the young generation that is entering to the market, and they are the tenants that who are renting the apartments. So in order to be competitive, you need to provide those services, and if you provide those services, you will be able to get the rent. Now, because there is not a lot of buildings like that, if you take Chelsea, Chelsea you can rent today without a doorman, without amenities, and you will still get $80 a square foot for your 
uh, apartment because the demand is so high and you cannot really build new construction there. And if you build, everybody is going to do a condo. So the pool of housing that you have in certain area, Greenwich Village, Chelsea, Lower East Side, you can push the rent to the highest level that you can have. Here's a question. Are there opportunities for buyers today? I mean, are there, do you see, you know, people, as you brought up, Adia, who is uh, from uh, Saudi, you know, from the Middle East, uh, GIC from China, Singapore, Singapore, and, you know, Oxford, you know, Canada and the other places. Do you, can can people buy properties? I mean, you, you're very active in the investment sales business. Who, who besides can families buy? Can, can individuals? I mean, who are the buyers today? Who, who's, who are we competing? Who, who's uh, over competing? On, on the residential side, I definitely believe that there are tremendous opportunities. A lot of the multifamily apartment building were, per, were built after the Second World War. And they are owned by already the third generation, and they own most of this real estate free and clear. And they didn't go and maximize value. So those guys did not push the rents. They didn't renovate the buildings. And for us, we always have a pipeline between half a billion to a billion of off-market deals. But I, I think the real question is not other opportunities, is how you take advantage of them and who gets to take advantage of them. Because Everything's about your capital partner today. Ofer would not be able to be successful if he didn't have an equity partner that gave him a low enough cost of capital that he would be, could be patient in the early t- days of turning his property around. And it's no different than any part of this market today. Because of the FERPTA laws prohibiting many foreign investors from owning more than 49%, the fact that these people want to put their money out If you are a successful and talented developer and you recognize opportunities, you'll be able to hook up with a a source of capital and you will hopefully earn your promote because you bought it right. And the guy who gets the lowest cost of capital is the winner because he doesn't care whether he's buying at five or six or seven as long as his cost of capital is cheap enough. And and Ofer for a long time um, had very good partners that allowed him to go in and buy. Now, the other opportunity is the families who don't have a IRR threshold because they're generational, they're holding forever. They could compete if they wanted to, but Bernie Mendick once said, if you buy IBM at 10, it's hard to buy it at 100. And that's why you have new buyers coming into the marketplace from time to time because of that. But you were saying prior to the show that a number of, <clears throat> people that you're representing are leasing the land because they want to keep the opportunity over there. They want to have an ownership. They realize that they're not capable or that's not their expertise to be building. So you're seeing more of that? Well, we're seeing uh, more of it. It's, it. Look, nothing is a lot in New York, right? In, in the highlight in 2007, we sold 20 office buildings last year, 14. It's not like th- there's that much on the market at any one time. But, it, but in the multifamily market... There are many owners that, that want to pass this on to their next generation. They're not sellers, but they want upside. And so they, they, they have a 99-year ground lease. They have appraisals every 20 years that goes to market. And there are many developers who build rental housing who are content uh, to take a long-term ground lease, finance the it's building. It's a nice thing to own. Right. So for his known. And, and the ultimate risk is when the 80-20 bonds you know, run out, and you have a ground lease reappraisal, do those two events col- collide or coincide? And, and, and those are risks. I mean, nothing is without a, some type of risk. We, we, what about, you know, there's, this to- there's a lot of development, you know, on the Hudson Yards area. You have the related and the Brookfield Hudson Yards, but you also have a lot of properties that people are talking about on the 10th Avenue, the 11th Avenue, from the 34th Street to 41st Street. So that's one market. You have Lower Manhattan, where we're talking about one Wall Street that they're talking about, you know, 85, uh, you know, where AIG was. Do you see, what's your thoughts about those markets as emerging markets, as opportunity markets? Because I can tell you, when I took OFA once down to Lower Manhattan, it was like a culture shock. I'm not sure anything today 
anymore as an emerging market, especially in office buildings. I think that, that um, Steve's done a great job um, at Hudson Yards creating an environment, um, and it's still going to take time for him to build the platform, but, but he made it the smart decision that he wouldn't try to make it all on the office. He would make it later on the retail and the multifamily. My, but, but having said that, Larry has a great project downtown at the World Trade Centers, um, and Brookfield's going to build 34th and 9th. I think ultimately um, there aren't going to be enough tenants for every single project in every single building. Somebody's going to win and somebody's not going to win. Um, I just don't think that the office stock of tenants is growing at any kind of great rate. The financial services industry has certainly consolidated. The law firm business has certainly consolidated. consolidated. The technology and new media has taken up some of that slack. Um, and will continue so, to grow. So, so hearing, but on the residential side, on the other hand, you don't have enough product. Right. Because if we had today another 1,000 units in Chelsea or the Hudson Yard, for example, wait a second, we own the wait, Olympia. But hold on. I, I, said, I, I brought up Lower Manhattan. You still uh, are adverse to Lower Manhattan? I'm not adverse. I, I prefer. In fact, I was uh, at the offices of Brookfield yesterday and I was stunned by the view, and I, every time I go to Battery Park, I, I look at it as, as a miracle, uh, and the lifestyle that they have there. But for me, and for the capital <coughs> that I represent, and I'd rather be in a, in a neighborhood uh, like the East Village, West Village, uh, but, but Michael, uh, I'm sorry. Hudson Yard, and I think that the rents that we are able to achieve in those areas uh, are between seventy to eighty dollars a square foot. In and and the, for me, the key in Manhattan is not just location, location, location. So I always said it's transportation, 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 of which is very important. Well, let's, let's go five years. Let's go five years into the future. Time Inc., McGraw Hill, Group M, Condé Nast. Jones Day, you can go on and on. I've been in business a long time. And for many, many years, tenants looked downtown and they stayed midtown. Low cost alternative, they didn't want to. I think there is no question today that downtown is now a place where any type of industry feels that they can relocate to. And that's going to ultimately create a market for Ofer that it may not be there today but it will be there five or 10 years from now because this is no longer just a spotty trend. This is happening, and it's because it's hard to get Class A product uh, in Midtown because uh, it's hard to build. But, but you do have the opportunities in the Hudson Yard for that type of product. Yes, and they're going there too. But Hudson Yards ultimately is six million feet of office and six million feet of multifamily, more or less. But, six million feet is one and a half But, but what the about the other space that we're talking about? You know, the sites that are being offered for sale today. You know, Rosenthal is selling a yes. site 1.2 million square feet. There's a number of sites on 10th and 11th Avenue near the Javits Center, which really did poorly over the years. Nobody wanted to be there. And it's still, it's not where the train is. It's, it's a different neighborhood, okay? I was but, addressing Ofer's point that he would prefer right now to be in Midtown. My point, though, is that when you, when you reach critical mass where you have 170 or so million feet downtown, and it's not just Wall Street, you will have people who want to live there. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, those, those projects um, that Larry has and that Brookfield has, where you can get Class A product and you can start to live down there, I, I think that has really been a paradigm shift in, in most of our thinking in, in recognizing that downtown is now a viable place for office tenants. But now when you relate that point, and it is a place for office tenants, one of the largest number of people who used to work downtown was a large number of people from Brooklyn and from Staten Island. Now there are new developments in Staten Island taking place on the waterfront over there where they're putting the wheel and where they're putting the, uh, the outlet stores. Uh, so you're going to see certain development in Staten Island in the residential market. You know, not for you. You can ferry, boat, water. Uh, what, what's your thoughts about Staten Island? I, 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 ha I don't really know enough about Staten Island to try to even guess what kind of market that will be. Um, but Brooklyn is a very short commute to lower Manhattan. 
And what about Jersey City? It's a 15 minute commute. Jersey City will always be a viable office market, but once again, the amount of office space that you can build there is very limited. And so when you look at the limitations of a Manhattan or a Jersey City when it comes to office and the amount of time it takes to build office, um, I think that these tenants that are moving both to Jersey now, City now, for tax reasons and for Lower Manhattan for price reasons. Now, you're, you're, I know your organization sold the development site at 125th and Park to Bruce Eichner, which was at one time planned to be an office Vernado. building. The, the Vornado site, okay? Now, Harlem had an interest. There was a limited number of buildings up in Harlem, office buildings. The commute is relatively well. It's a quick commute into... Do you see commercial and do you see residential opportunities there? I always look at the residential opportunities there. In fact, I have a building on 109 and 5th Avenue. Which I've been to, yes. And, and I feel that that market is still lagging a lot behind the Upper West Side or Upper East Side. And even when you're talking about in the 90s, uh, because there is not enough retail to the, the people who are going to live there. So if you don't have retail, if you don't have restaurant, if you don't have shops, it's very, very difficult to go in to build a residential community. I, I more like the location of 34th Street between 10th and 11th because you are walking distance to uh, Chelsea, to the galleries, I mean, to I, the, I, I, I the High Line. I don't think so, there's so, the 34th so Street, 10th and 11th, yes. but you have the train, you have, the, you, know, you have Penn Station, you have the Port Authority, you have a lot of amenities, you have a lot of things. It's more vibrant, place. it's more exciting. So we look, every day when I come uh, to the city, I pass by location uh, in uh, uptown, in Harlem, and I'm trying to look for site or look for apartment buildings to buy. But the returns are not making it... It's like uh, what Jimmy was saying before about the Bronx. You know, he had represented a seller, and, you know, the Bronx is not attracting the same pricing as Manhattan is yeah. or as Brooklyn is because Brooklyn has become so And you have big. to remember, Michael, we are also in the residential, not just the fair market building. We are on the rent stabilized. Whenever we have a turnover in a unit in the rent stabilized, we are able to take the rent from $1,000 to 4000 If you are taking the same unit in the Bronx, you are taking, if you have a turnover, you take the rent from 600 to 1100 So the delta is not large enough for us to go and to make the investment there. How do you see the next 18 months in the real estate market? I think that I don't expect any big changes in the real estate market in 18 months. I think the market will continue to be very vibrant in the multifamily market. I think that the uh, Midtown South market in office um, is extraordinary. There's really not a lot of space there. Um, it looks like Lower Manhattan will continue to get uh, tenants to go downtown. There's still an awful lot of space that, that can be built and to get absorbed. So it doesn't mean that that market's going to start, you know, escalating dramatically in price, but it'll be solidifying. Um, and then the question is going to be, when all these tenants are done moving, you're going to have a big bunch of space left in, in, in Midtown uh, Manhattan. Sixth Avenue. We and the question is going to be, who's going to fill that space? And that'll yeah, be the yeah, interesting so, question. So, but it's so, not 18 months that we have to worry about. Okay, so, 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 so at least in, in our residential market, I feel very comfortable on the rental for the next 18 months. I believe that we will have a spike around 10% increase in rent. I'm a little bit concerned about the condo market between the $5,000 to $10,000 a square foot. Well, fortunately, we didn't talk about that, but I, I really, it's always great to have good friends and supporters here, and I'm so happy that the two of you have been here to help me today. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you.